closing oh, session here tonight <clears throat> is in memory of Izzy and Babs Esper. We've asked Shai Abramson, the consultant for the Asper Foundation, to say a few words about them. Shai. Devised over 15 years ago by Dr. Asper, who together with his wife Babs were leading philanthropists from Winnipeg, Canada, the Asper International Holocaust Studies Program at the International School for Holocaust Studies at Yad Vashem continues to raise awareness and facilitate key outreach in Holocaust education on the Yad Vashem campus in Jerusalem and around the world. The closing session of the Biennial International Educators Conference is a highlight of the program and has been attended by many of the children, including Gail and David and Leonard Asper, Izzy and Bad's children, who today continue the wonderful work of their parents. It is my honor to represent them here tonight. It's also my honor to be able to welcome Natan Sharansky, who is giving this year's address. He's perhaps the most celebrated and admired symbol of overcoming adversity, of true Jewish perseverance <laughs> in the world of hatred. These were values that were important to the Asper Foundation when we created our program at Yad Vashem and remain so today and are a part of our work around the world. We are also delighted that this year's international conference places focus on a subject that is so important to current Jewish uh, discourse. It is incumbent upon us all to continue to teach the legacy of the Shoah in a way that directly addresses our future generations. The Asper Foundation identifies with this legacy wholly, as can be seen when you visit the Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg, where the Holocaust education is in the central gallery of the museum. The museum, which is uh, one of the first new national museums in Canada in 40 years, and the first ever outside of Ottawa, was the brainchild of the Asper Foundation, and inspired by the extraordinary impact of our human rights and Holocaust studies program in Canada. We cannot lose sight of the importance of teaching Holocaust. Today, especially when in Canada, the US, Latin America, Europe and the FSU, all the countries that you represent. Holocaust denial and distortion are on the rise, coming from all quarters, along with anti-Semitism. Our students and even our teachers remain nervous to approach the Holocaust, a subject that is so imposing and vast that so many of you teachers and principals, decision makers, that you decided to spend your valuable time with us here and to have this important discourse brings us great satisfaction and gratification. Here at Yad Vashem, the World Center for, Hol for Holocaust Remembrance, they're doing unbelievable things on a level that is unparalleled around the world. And as your partners in this conference and in this vision, we want to thank you. We stand with you as we face together the challenges of education on Holocaust, against Holocaust denial, against anti-Semitism, and keeping Holocaust history relevant and engaging. On behalf of the staff and trustees of the Asper Foundation, we want to congratulate Yad Vashem and all of you for a very successful conference. We also, we also want to wish you a Chag Ulim Sameach, that we may take our light out into the world 
and continue to be a force for good. And, in the words of Israel Asper, imparting the lessons of the Holocaust and educating people worldwide to help ensure that the rally call never again refers not only to the Jewish people, but to all peoples. Thank you and enjoy. As has been ha min hagamokum, we're lighting another Hanukkah from the Yad Vashem Artifacts Division. This is a special Hanukkah. It represents return to life. The menorah we've been lighting this evening was mid 1947. Tafshin Tashach, as you see engraved on the Hanukkah. In the vocational workshop for Holocaust survivors established by the JDC, the Jewish Agency, and the Central Committee of Bavarian Jewry. These workshops were set up in order to train Holocaust survivors in different professions. One of the workshops, a ceramics <coughs> workshop, was organized with the help of a former employee of the company Rosenthal Bavaria. This mineral was among the first items made in this ceramics workshop. The truncated tree, that you see over here, <coughs> with a sprouting leaf on the menorah, the sprouting leaf is actually the shamish, that you see over here, are the symbols of the Shoah and the rebirth of Israel. It was dedicated to B.T., you see the initials, Benish Tach, a member of the vocational board, and his initials are engraved in the center. This is all we knew about the Minoah that I received from our archives division until I received the phone, the phone number of Aviva Thach Sandler, the daughter of Benish, who lives today in Michigan, the United States. I had a very long and moving conversation about her family and this Minoah that we're using tonight to provide more details about her family. Benish Thach was born in 1911 in Kovno, Lithuania, the fourth of five children of Leb and Rhonda Takash. He was a lively boy, an excellent student at the Zionist Gymnasium, who received a broad education, including modern Hebrew. He then studied to become an attorney. The four boys in the family, Isaac, Moshe, Benish, and Pesach, were all athletes and members of the Maccabi. Moshe and Pesach went to Palestine to complete in the games, compete in the games, and Pesach chose to remain. He was standing guard in a kibbutz, and he was gunned down by a sniper only six months later. Benish became an attorney. He was involved in real estate and import and export. He met his wife, Riva, and got involved in the Maccabea as well. They were married in 1941, and their oldest child, Aviva, was born in 1942 in the Kovno ghetto. As it became clearer, the Nazis were systematically rounding up people and making surprise raids to ferret out children. Benish and Riva realized they need to find someone to take their two-year-old child. They connected with someone. She was sedated and taken out of the ghetto in a car filled with straw. Shortly after the ghetto was disbanded and the residents were taken to concentration camps and work camps, Benish was taken to Dachau and Riva to several different work camps. Both miraculously managed to survive, as did some other members of their families. Aviva was reunited with her parents. After a time of Recuperation in DP camp, Benish felt the need to do something positive. He became involved with the JDC with a mission to educate the boys, now young men, who had spent time under normal circumstances, they would have learned to trade in the concentration camps. He was instrumental in maintaining a school in Munich, offering a wider programs leading to employability for the students. He was charming, sincere, a motivated speaker. In the process, Many of the contributors offered to sponsor him and his family should he want to come to the United States. During the stay in Munich, another daughter, Rhoda, was born in 1949. Eventually, they left Germany, came to the United States. They chose Detroit, Michigan, because the climate was almost identical to Kovno. The job he was offered was a supervisor of construction for a large building company. And during that time, his son, Leonard Lib, was born. Initially, knowing nothing about construction, Benish had a long and successful career 
to the Holtzman and Silverman Construction Company and Rose Device President. Riva taught Ivrit at a Hebrew school for more than 40 years. Their circumstances normalized and they were able to live out their lives in peace. The menorah created the trade school in honoring our father symbolized the resilience and tenacity of the Jewish people. To Takach now Thatch family, it symbolized the strength and tenacity of our father Benish. Our family did not want this precious menorah to become lost over time and decided it belonged at Yad Vashem. Our mother and father would have been so proud to have its light shine one more time in Eretz Yisrael. And I may add, when I added that Nathan Sharansky would be lighting this menorah, she was crying on the phone. You apparently visited Detroit not long ago, and she wanted to meet with you, but circumstances had it that she did not get a chance to meet you. So having you light the menorah this evening is especially significant. As with every story, there's a story within a story. We couldn't bring members of the Thatch family, but we do have another family sitting with us here today, the Wax family. Please stand up. All the family. <laughs> Robbie was born in 1947 in a DP camp in northern Germany, but spent five, six years of his childhood in a DP camp in Bavaria in southern Germany called Frohenwald. It was in this camp, among others, that Benish Touch created trade schools where the DPs could learn a trade and where this green menorah was created. I've asked Robbie to come with his family and take part in lighting the candles for the sixth night of Hanukkah. We have the honor of having Nathan Sharansky with us this evening, the chairman of the Jewish Agency. A few words about Nathan Sharansky. March 15, 1977. He was arrested on multiple charges, including high treason and spying for the Americans. The accusation stipulated that he passed to the West lists of over 1,300 refuseniks, many of whom were denied exit visas. High treason carried the death penalty. The following year, 1978, he was sentenced to 13 years of forced labor. <coughs> he spent time in the Fort Ono prison in Moscow, followed by Vladimir in Christopol prisons, but for part of the time, he was placed in solitary confinement. His health deteriorated to the point of endangering his life. Later he was attained in Perm 35, a post-Stalin Gulag type of the so-called strict regiment colony in Perm Oblast. He kept himself sane during solitary confinement by playing chess with himself in his head. Not that Sharansky was released, was released on February 11th, 1986, as part of a large exchange of detainees. He was the first political prisoner released by Gorbachev due to intense political pressure from the President Ronald Reagan. In 1995, Nathan Sharansky and Yuli Edelstein founded the Israel Baliyah Party, promoting the absorption of Soviet Jews into Israeli society. He served as a Minister of Industry and Trade, Interior Ministry of Israel, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Housing and Construction, a Minister Without Portfolio. Today, he's the Chairman of the Executive of the Jewish Agency. Nathan, you are a symbol of tenacity, determination and resolution. You said niet to the entire gulag system. You suffered cold, hunger, solitude, humiliation, but you said, I will be Jewish. Your Jewish identity and desire to make aliyah to Israel was part and parcel of who you are. This is the modern day story of Hanukkah. You relate in your book an instance where you decide to like a Hanukkah in the Gulag and you created your own special blessing, which I will repeat from your book. The blessing you then made was the following. Blessed art you, blessed art thou, Lord our God, for allowing me to rejoice on this day of Hanukkah, the holiday of liberation, the holiday of our return to the way of our fathers. Blessed art you, the Lord our God, for allowing me to light these candles. May you allow me to light the Hanukkah candles many times in your city, in Jerusalem, with my wife, Avital, and my family and friends. I know we took you away from your party, 40 of the daughters of birthday party, so thank you for being with us. 
and you added one more component to that blessing. And may the day come when all our enemies who are today planning our destruction will stand before us and hear our prayers and say, Amen. The prison guard didn't know Hebrew. And you said what you said, and you survived. I want to add one other, pro one other detail. I'm the one that comes up to you every time when you're in the Bagel Cafe in America Fahim, when I see you sitting there with one of your daughters and grandchildren, and I say to you, Shabbat Shalom Nathan Shahansky. I hope I'm not bothering you, but you are my hero. You are a hero and shining light to us all. Please come up to the stage to light the candles of the sixth night of Hanukkah. I ask the all of you to please come up as well. soldiers that we invited to come and be part of this conference on the last day. Ephraim Liebman. Thank you for coming. I invite Nathan Chelansky to address us. Well, dear friends, uh, uh, I was asked to speak on the topic of Jewish identity in Israel and modern world. But then, just now I looked at the program. My God, we had such interesting lectures. I'd like to listen to them. So I, you probably know this topic more than I do now. Uh, so I'll make simply some remarks based on my experience as a Jewish activist and as the head of Jewish agency uh, about Shoah and Israel. You know, recently I was in one of the relatively small Jewish communities in Turkey, in Istanbul. And uh, it's only 15,000 Jews. Once it was a much bigger community. Uh, but it's a small but strong community with a very good Jewish school, the, maybe the most protected Jewish school in the world. Uh, but, uh, and in fact, you see that in, there is kind of integrity, self-confidence, Shlemut in this community. And I was thinking, why there is such a strange feeling of stability, of some kind of conservative, uh, as if it is kept itself three years. And then you realize, but when I went to the Jewish museum, their Jewish museum, and you read all their history, 
the Jewish community which didn't go through Holocaust. It's so unusual in Europe. Just near there is Greek Jewish community, over 5,000 Jews, but that's absolutely destroyed. Well, they are making big efforts and they have school and everything is good, but 100,000 Jews were sent to camps, Saloniki Jews, Otuna, everything was destroyed. And you cannot really fully recover. Uh, there are many rabbis and many psychologists who explain that all our problems, all our diseases, uh, ne uh, soul diseases, which Jewish people are coming from Shoah. And you look in, in Poland, in, uh, uh, there was, there is some theater in Poland, you know, the Jewish theater where actors play in Yiddish, and it's, this Yiddish, actors don't eat, know Yiddish, they are learning by heart, the words. Those who are coming to watch, they don't know Yiddish, they listen to the translation. And so you ask, why are you doing it? Well, if nobody understands it, well, but we have to revive Jewish life. There is no way to revive Jewish life. By the way, I am very grateful, and we are very supportive of every attempt to rebuild Jewish life in, in Warsaw and in Krakow and some other places. But there is no way to bring back that unbelievable world, a real Jewish world with all the rabbis and Hasidim and uh, schools and debates uh, of, of Jews of all. So, uh, and practically, well, this, uh, you look okay, but in France there is such a healthy community. We'll speak a little bit about France later, but if you look what happened to Ashkenazi Jewish community, and they all assimilated or made Aliyah to Israel, and a very, very small community, which there was, and Sephardic Jewish community has really brought a lot of energy. But it's again, it's a community which practically had, had no Shoah. So there is no real restoration from Shoah. There is no such a thing. If you speak about the community. But there is one thing. They're in the state of Israel. And it's interesting, well, here just, in Yad Vashem, I, some years ago, I heard, so heard a very good lecture of Professor Bauer, why it is a mistake to say that Israel was created as a result of Shoah, Holocaust. And he, and I think it's very convincing and very good and very good to remember that it's not that because of Holocaust, the world gave us Israel. The world was not going to give us Israel. We took it, we made it, we created it. But no doubt that the Israel is by far the biggest cure from Shoah which we ever had. That was, uh, even those who were not Zionists, and most of Jewish world was not Zionists, they became Zionists simply because that was the only something optimistic which happened. My mother told me many years later, because in our childhood we had zero knowledge about anything connected to Jewishness and Zion. But she was telling me that the year of 1948, that's when I was born, but that was the, the creation of the state of Israel was knowing so little about it. It was like the first light in this absolute darkness. There is no future, only past, and better not to know about this past. The Soviet Jews, well, we knew now know nothing about Holocaust because of two reasons. First of all, it was the policy of the Soviet Union, but second, Jews didn't want to talk about it. My, uh, my wife, Avita, uh, uh, her father, who was the only survivor of a big family, didn't want to tell anything. They practically didn't know they're Jewish and they didn't know the story of Holocaust of their own family. It's interesting that when we became Zionists, then Holocaust became very important to us. In fact, one of the first times that I was arrested as a Zionist activist was on my way to Babi Yar because as a part of our Zionist activity, we also were insisting on our right to go back uh, to our roots and to know the truth because our future was guaranteed by the fact that we overcome uh, our past. And, uh, if you look at America, an American Jewry, that's also a very interesting story. Uh, we in Soviet Jew, uh, in Soviet Union, we were practically absolutely assimilated, knew nothing about ourselves, and then this powerful message in 1967 from Israel, and this awful humiliation of the of Soviet Union in 1967, and this awful anti-Israeli campaign launched in 1967, and suddenly you see that the world looks on you as part of this. 
where those who love you, those who hate you, they all connect you to you. And you want to understand it? And when we, that's when we start reading in the underground about ourselves, and, and suddenly we discovered our history, our people, our state, and that's when we started struggling. But our struggle would have no chance to survive even one day in the Soviet Union, if from the very first day it was not the struggle of all the Jews of the world. If you have this demonstration of 10 people for five minutes in the center of Moscow, and of course you are arrested, and it is not supported next day by hundreds of thousands of Jews all over the world, and first of all Jews of America, if it is not connected immediately through Congress, through Senate, through Western leaders to the most important interests of the Soviet Union, it could never happen. And what was the motto of American Jews? It started from, almost started from the book of Elie Wiesel, the Jews of Silence, where all this book was that we did it already once. We were silent on the Holocaust. I can't imagine that we would be silent again. And then all this slogan of the struggle was never again. Never again me means not about Soviet Union, not about Jews. It was all about American Jewry being silent uh, during Shoah. And then Rav Luxen, whose name unfortunately today is, comes back uh, to Katarot, to the newspapers, because of our chief rabbinate not recognizing his conversions. And that's one of our own stupidities. But Rav Luxen, who visited us in those days in Moscow, and uh, he wrote a book comparing, uh, I'm my, my brother's keeper, comparing the behavior of American Jewry during Shoah and uh, during the so uh, when the question of Soviet Jews came. And it's clear from the book, but it's also clear from the experience with thousands and thousands of American Jews who later all were in KGB files as my accomplices, because I, as a spokesman of our movement, was meeting with these people over there. It was so clear from where these people are taking the energy. It was 25 years of struggle, when people devoted a lot of their own time and, and uh, energy and, and money for this struggle. It was all like trying to erase this page of the, the guilt feelings, to overcome these guilt feelings of Shaw. And I do believe that it played a great role in American Jewry coming back to their identity and overcoming this feeling of tragedy of Shah and those who were silent witnesses of this. Uh, Israel, the fact that there is no better answer how to rebuild your Jewish identity, how to rediscover it, but touch Israel, that was discovered by American Jews, not by us, by the American Jews in fact, Cray invented this idea of birthright. Not because they wanted to make Aliyah, those, the founders of birthright didn't want that their children would make Aliyah. But they found out that there is no way for them. They came from Shoah, so they have strong Jewish identity because of the tragedy. But how to give this feeling of pride to their children? They found out only by bringing them for 10 days to Israel, they came, started negotiating with the Israeli government, and the Israeli government decided also to invest money, and that's how birthright was launched. But I can tell today, from my experience practically, with every community in the world, of course we have a huge challenge of uh, uh, assimilation. In fact, two biggest challenges of Jewish people, assimilation and demonization of Israel. And in both we need one another. Because in every community, it can be Brazil, it can be Ukraine, it can be Turkey, it can be France. There, is, there are two, only two Balamin, two anchors, uh, which are working against assimilation. It's faith and Zionism, connection to your tradition and connection to the state of Israel. If you have both, great. If you have at least one, there is something to work with. If you don't have both, your great grandchildren will not be Jewish. Similar statistics. Well, of course, you can always find different story, but statistically, and see that that's true for everyone. So, after the tragedy of Shoah, and we cannot 
continue building our identity only on the tragedy. To the contrary, we started speaking about our past only when we have a home. And that's where comes Israel, which is extremely important for, uh, for our fight against uh, assimilation and rebuilding our identity. And one word, uh, as Hannah uh, Krishna, I cannot uh, finish it without speaking about Western Europe. Because what's happening today, in the last five, five years, in Western Europe is absolutely unprecedented. Never before in the history of Israel from 1948, there was such a big number of Jews in the free Europe who decided to move to Israel. And the figures, like they were up to 8,000 this year, they are from France, they are lower because they found they, that our apartments are not cheap enough and so on. That's, my, that's the problem, the technical details. 50% of French Jews, and it's not only our study, it's the study of French government, 50% of French Jews already decided that the future of their children will not be in France. 50% of 300,000 from 600,000 communities. So the pro and their first choice by far is Israel. Then comes, of course, questions, practical questions, recognition of their diplomas, the cost of the apartments, and so on. But that's already technical. The very fact that there is such a huge change, huge, unbelievable, if you compare that nothing like this was happening in the last thirty years. And you ask him why. And three years ago I wrote an article that I believe there is no future for Jews in France, and not because I don't share the belief of some of our leaders who think that we always have to shout to world jury, make it, come to Israel, you have no future. I don't believe that anybody makes their decision because he's called to do it. But studying or talking to hundreds and hundreds of Jews <laughs> in France, I think I understood very well why so many of them decided there is no future for them. Because France, well, of course, the first obvious answer, there is such a huge part of France, which is Islamic France. And even if the, even if the majority of those millions of new citizens of France are all citizens, but that's definitely a group which doesn't like us, which doesn't want to study Shoah in, in the schools, it doesn't permit to teach us to teach her, and from which, of course, some terrorists are coming out. And then, Near this, there is old, classical, conservative, Christian France, which tries to be very friendly to, to Jews. But you cannot forget the history. And the, uh, some Jews say, OK, I'm for, uh, born in Le Pen, but I'm going to leave the moment she comes to power, I'm going to leave. <laughs> well, well, I say, why if you're born in Le Pen? Well, because we know that for this France, we are always the other, historically. If uh, there was the other in Europe, and this the other was Jewish, of course. And then there is the biggest part, liberal France, which is not simply home of Jews, which was built by Jews. All the ideas of this liberal France were developed from Napoleon to this day, if you look, uh, what an integral part Jews were of liberal France. And today, liberal France, in the last 20 years, every year it's more and more, is extremely anti-Zionist, extremely anti-Zionist. And what to do? In today's world, you cannot be a, it, it is very unfashionable, it's politically wrong to be anti-Semite. But you can be anti-Zionist. And if you are, and, and it's almost natural. Sometimes Soviet Union was using it as a pretext. And Zionists, it, it's simply not to use the word uh, that they are anti-Semites, anti but we all knew that that's all the pretext. Today it's normal. <laughs> That to be, to think good about Jews, but to hate Israel in its most extreme forms. And, and for Jew, for Jew for whom his identity or her identity is important, to be in the society where every day the newspapers which your friends are reading, and every day is explained that Israel is the biggest war criminal, and Israel is doing to Palestinians what not as uh, not we're doing to Jews. I'm not going to, to parliament, I hope I, I don't have to explain why all this is wrong. But to go to your bank or to a company where you work, to hear, well, you are such a great guy, of course you cannot be part of these war criminals and so on. And it's very uncomfortable. And that the, when Jews feel that this world, 
they live in is all anti-Jewish or anti-Israel, they feel they're very uncomfortable. And, and that's why I think that this exodus of Jews from Western Europe, if leaders of Europe will not make something very dramatic, change their whole attitude to the only democracy uh, in the Middle East and the national Jewish state when nationalism is not popular in Europe. If you will not do it, then don't do it, nothing will help. Because for Jews today, the world without Israel is the world without optimism, without hope, and without Jewish identity. And that's maybe one of the most fundamental consequences of this awful tragedy that we went through. A great answer which we gave you. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. And we have to bid him farewell. This is the part of the conference where I get to say thank you to all of my colleagues, everyone that's been involved. And first, Avner is not here, but Dorit is here. And Eyal, Dr. Eyal Kaminka. This whole idea began in September of last year. And I got a call inside my diary, a zimun, that Avner, Dorit, and Eyal want to meet with me. I'm being called to the principal's office. You know what that means. <laughs> Couldn't be a good, good sign. And I didn't know what it was all about. So I come to the meeting. I get all dressed up like I'm dressed up now. I say, it's all, all my funeral, all my birthday party. <laughs> I've been at Yad Vashem for 27 years. And you get to step in a lot of people's toes in 27 years. I must have crushed somebody's big toe. And I sat down. And if Neil looks at me, he says, oh, fine, why are you all dressed up? I said, well, I don't know if it's my funeral or birthday party. And he smiles, the Avner smile, and he says, listen, we decided we want you to be responsible for the Jewish world. We want you to create a conference for senior Jewish educators from all over the world. I didn't have a lot of time to say yes, no, maybe, I'll think about it. Avner is a Brigadier General. He gives an order, you say, yes, sir. And so I did. And our, <laughs> our team went to work, but I want to thank Avner, he's not here, but please pass on to Dorit and to Eyal for the trust in faith and the challenge that they decided to challenge me with. Karanit, where's Karanit? Kalanit, I managed not to get you angry at all during this conference. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. And Shana, who is our budgetary accountant, I managed to stay within the budget, which is a first for me. Where's Shulamit? Shulamit's here? Shulamit. You're all the way back. Shumit is not just our pedagogical director. On Tuesday, Yudha Bauer called us the piccolo. In every, in humanity, there are different voices and different instruments. The Jews are the piccolo. Shumit, you are Mozart. <laughs> and working with Shumit, we've been together for the past 27 years here at Yad Vashem is always thrilling educational experience to put together all the nuts and bolts, inviting different people from different disciplines here to this conference. I want to thank all the different divisions here at Yad Vashem, Information Technology, the Archives, the Museum, the Library, the Communications Media Department. Where's Simi? Yifat. Thank you very much. The International Relations Department, Commemoration Department, Osnat Levy, a, who was extremely helpful in bringing some of the musical uh, performances we had here. 
But to all my colleagues at the International School for Holocaust Studies, the teacher training department, the guiding department, the internet department, a special thanks to Roman and Uwe for the editing and the video we had of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. Rochelle, she already left, but to her and the entire European department, a special thank you to our Genesis people. Where's Masha? Where's Masha? Okay, Masha, and to Anna, to Freddie, Tanya, to you of course, thank you very much. Spasiba, thank you very much. Moshiko, Israel, Israel, our entire maintenance team. Sammy and the cleaning crew here, without them, it wouldn't look the way it looks here. But to my team, I call my team the K team. It's actually a dream team. And we've been working on this intensely for the past six months. It's been a binding and bonding experience for us all. Chaya, Eliana, Lori, Steffi, who was the voice in Shumi's presentation on Wednesday, Adi, Yoni, Moshe, Daniel, where is Deborah? Deborah Frapp, Deborah? Our volunteer from Paris. Yael Baklo Khan, where's Yael? Please stand up. She did the PowerPoint presentation with all the different schools. She's been helping us with this conference from the beginning. Do we stand up, please? The week has a special title in my department. We call the Queen of Logistics. <laughs> and if anyone needs a logistics person, that's the person. You can't have her, though. She's staying with me, at least as long as I'm a Gad Vashem, and you'll decide what you want to do. And God help you if you sit in her chair, you move her stapler, do anything to her desk, you're dead. <laughs> Dewey, this would have been impossible. The logistics, the perfection, the hotels, all your checks, Everything worked like clockwork, and thank you for being believed. But it's to you, the Schleppers, from 34 different countries. You came. We convinced you. In 34 different countries, more than 200 principals, headmasters, leaders in Jewish education, you decide to come, make the trip, sit here for the last four days, and we hope that we met your expectations, we certainly learned from all of you, and we intend to see this as a beginning. So thank you for being with us. I promise not to steal but one minute, uh, otherwise the wit will kill me, um, <laughs> of your time uh, to thank, special thanks to the MC and the uh, manager and the leader of uh, the Jewish department, Ephraim, Ephraim uh, usually tells um, stories that are almost true. I was surprised to, uh, to realize that the thing that you said about how uh, the establishment of the Jewish department and this conference uh, was created about last September uh, a little bit more than a year ago, uh, that was 95% true. Uh, the true story is when we offered uh, and told Ephraim to do this, he said no. <laughs> because it would have been, according to his, uh, his words, too complicated to work with the Jewish world. <laughs> And it took us several months to woo him and to convince him, and I'm very happy that we did. You did a wonderful job, Dorit as well. Um, so big applause for him. And thank you very much. For